So what is NSX? As I said, it's a solution that allows you to build overlay virtual networks, and it includes more or less all components you need when building application stacks in cloud environment. So it has layer two and layer three segments. It has both inter-subnet firewalls in vSphere version, as well as distributed VMNIC level firewalls. In vSphere version, you get load balancers, NAT, and VPN concentrator. And in all cases, you get layer 2 and layer 3 gateways into the physical world. There are two deployment models. There is NSX for multi-hypervisor environment. This is the control plane that runs with numerous hypervisors, ESX as well as Linux-based hypervisors. And this is actually Nasira's NVP with numerous enhancements. And then you have NSX for vSphere, which is a merger of Nicera's NVP and vCNS, the product previously known as vShield, plus some major enhancements that I'll talk about. The important part is that although you will have a unified API, so the NSX API that you can use to program it, you will still have both vShield Manager API and NVP API. So you will be able to use either one of the APIs that you have used in the past. Now, if we start building the whole NSX architecture, first, obviously, we need the physical gear. We need the physical networking gear that provides IP connectivity that we'll later use. And although the physical switches could be connected in any topology, and they could provide layer two or layer three connectivity as you wish, the topology I have here on the slide is definitely not a good one. What I would use is leaf and spine fabric with layer two being limited to one or maybe a pair of top of rack switches to minimize the broadcast domains. Ideally, you would have leaf and spine architecture with layer three going as far out as possible, because that gives you equidistant bandwidth, so any two endpoints have the same bandwidth between them, and it makes the network stable because you don't have flooding and all the other bridging-related issues. Next. We add hypervisor hosts to the fabric, and we add appliances. Now, at least NSX for multiple hypervisors still uses physical appliances, and I'll tell you what they are. And NSX for vSphere uses only virtual machines. So you connect the hosts and appliances to the physical infrastructure, and then, of course, you need the soft switches. The soft switches run both in hypervisor hosts and in the appliances, and they implement layer 2 and layer 3 virtual networks while using the IP transport in the middle to exchange data. Now that you have the infrastructure, you can start implementing virtual network segments in the soft switches, and as I said, they use MAC over IP encapsulation in the middle. Next, we need a controller cluster. NSX uses a proper control plane to distribute the forwarding information to the virtual switches, so we need a redundant cluster of controllers to configure all the soft switches, be it in hypervisor hosts or in the appliances. The cluster has at minimum three nodes, and currently the supported maximum is five nodes. Now, the appliances come in different flavors. First, NSX needs a few service nodes, and I'll tell you where and when we need them to provide some centralized functionality. And then we have the gateways to the physical world. If we focus first on the transport infrastructure and what's going on there, and then we'll go more into the virtual world, in the transport infrastructure, we have three different communication paths. And ideally, you would have them in different VLANs, or even better, because we are doing layer 3 switching in different VRFs. 
In the data plane, we are exchanging traffic between virtual machines encapsulated in IP. We can use GRE. This is not NVGRE. This is traditional GRE. Encapsulation format is the same. It's just that fields in the GRE header have a slightly different meaning, but that's just semantics. You can use STT or you can use VXLAN encapsulation. So any of the three. None of them is encrypted within the data center. So do keep the data plane totally secure. And if you need to extend that to remote sites, you can establish encrypted tunnels so that the WAN connections are protected. On the control plane, everything is encrypted. Between the controller and the soft switches, we have SSL sessions over TCP, and the controller and the switches use self-signed certificates to authenticate each other. And on the management plane, which is from the controller to the outside world, it's either REST API or web access to the NSX manager, and it uses HTTPS, so yet again, everything is encrypted. Before moving forward, we have a number of questions. There is one for you, Brad. Is Hyper-V support available in the future? Um, Hyper-V support is something that we're targeting for 2014. What about environments that are offering Trill or Fabric Path at layer two? Well, you can definitely use those networks to run NSX on top. It's just that all the hypervisors will be in one IP subnet. As long as you don't increase the network size to the proportions where ARP would become a problem, you will be fine. What is NSX role from SDM perspective? Do I need NSX if I have SDN with OpenFlow? Well, NSX is one of the SDN solutions, and at least one deployment of NSX uses OpenFlow internally. But it's up to you to decide whether you want to implement your virtual networks with NSX or with something else. Why does the controller have minimum three nodes? That's an interesting one. The reason is that the nodes in the controller use Paxos, which is a voting protocol, and you need an odd number of members to have an ambiguous vote. That's why the minimum number of nodes in the cluster is three. What NIC teaming options are recommended in NSX networks? Is there an option to associate multiple VTAP IP addresses to a hypervisor for redundancy and high availability? Sure, you have the option to have multiple VTEPs on a hypervisor server, one for each NIC, or you could take a NIC, a dual ported NIC, and do a port channel out of that NIC and have a single VTEP IP on that port channel going to a top or X, which that will work as well. If the VMs have no common layer 2 adjacency, how would vMotion work? Well, VMs have common layer 2 adjacency, it's only implemented on top of IP. So vMotion, from the VM perspective, works just fine. Obviously, the problem is the transport network. So there is still officially a requirement to have a layer 2 domain between the kernel NICs for the vMotion to work. We all know it works over layer 3 network as well, but if you want to stay within that environment, at least with vSphere 5.1, then obviously you have to have layer two transport network in the transport core. Now, Brad, would you know whether this requirement will be removed with vSphere 5.5? I'm not sure exactly the answer to that, Ivan. I think the official state of position by VMware is still a layer two network for vMotion, but I know that it's something that if you talk to your VMware account team about that they can, uh, you know, perhaps make some exceptions in a, from a, in a support standpoint. But I think the official position is still a layer two VLAN for vMotion, unless Scott knows better than I do on that. Yeah, you're spot on, Brad. The support statement still states that uh, we need a, a layer two adjacency for the VM kernel interfaces. But, uh, you know, VMware is actively working on changes that, uh, that may show up in, in future products that uh, would alleviate that requirement. 
Next one, are there limitations to the topology of the underlying physical network? Actually, no. As long as it can provide IP connectivity, we are fine. Obviously, as I said before, I would recommend that you build a network with equidistant endpoints, for example, something like leaf and spine architecture, so that all hypervisors have equal bandwidth to all other hypervisors, so that you're not limiting your workload placement or affecting performance with the workload placement. Similar to OpenFlow is an out-of-band network recommended in NSX networks for control and management plane communications. Brad, would you address this? Are we recommending that people run like kernel NICs on a different NIC or at least in Linux environments? Can we run everything on two shared uplinks, for example? You probably could, but what we see most customers doing, and I think what our professional support recommends, is that the management connection to a hypervisor that's running the connections to the NSX controller and other virtualization management tools would be on a separate, uh, perhaps a one gig um, Ethernet link. You're running that traffic separate from your actual production data traffic, which might be, you know, again, one gig NICs or maybe even 10 gig NICs. Okay, so let's move from the transport infrastructure into the virtual network and focus on the virtual switches because this will immediately answer a few of the questions. In the NSX for multiple hypervisors deployment, if you're running a Linux server, Linux hypervisor, then you will use the existing OpenV switch. Well, you will use one bundled with NSX to ensure that you are on the right release level and that the OpenV switch has the same functionality, but basically it's more or less the same OpenV switch that you have in your Zen or KVM environments. For ESXi environments, there will be an NSX V switch which will be native in the kernel, so it will not be a VM-based solution like MVP uses today. And in all cases, all three encapsulations will be supported, GRE, STT, and VXLAN. However, VXLAN will not have multicast support. So VXLAN encapsulation will work, but it will not run over multicast. And there is a special protocol, and I'll go into that later on, between the NSX controller and the hardware gateway devices that allows you to do VXLAN between hardware gateway devices and NSX cloud network, even though there is no multicast involved. Communication between the controller and OpenV switch is OpenFlow for layer two forwarding and access control lists. Then there is the OVS DB protocol, which is a configuration protocol between another component, the OVS DB server and the controller. OVS DB protocol is used for switch configuration, for port configuration, and numerous other things like exporting statistics. And layer three forwarding, is implemented locally in the hypervisor with yet another combination of user module and OpenV switch kernel module. You know that OpenV switch has a split user space kernel space implementation. So in the kernel module, the kernel module does only flow based forwarding. And whenever you get an unknown flow like a new session, the packet is punted to the user space daemon and the user space daemon looks up the OpenFlow tables, or it may look up layer three tables, and then install the new flow forwarding information into the kernel module, so the subsequent packets of the same flow are going straight through the kernel. On the vSphere side, there is no OpenV switch, so NSX for vSphere uses the existing distributed virtual switch, it already has the VXLAN kernel module from VCNS. It also uses the existing security module that implements today Mac and IP source guard. And there are two new kernel modules for firewalling and layer three forwarding. So all the data plane functionality is implemented with these kernel modules. There is no punting to user mode. 
And the only user mode module is the user world agent, which communicates with the controller. And here, NSX is no longer using OpenFlow, it's using a different, more optimized protocol. Currently, the limitation is that there is one-to-one -one mapping between vCenter and NSX controller, and that limitation will eventually disappear. Is there any word on NSX for vSphere release date? I think what we're targeting is October, if I'm allowed to say that, but I did, so sometime next month. Can the same NSX controller cluster be used to manage both NSX for multi-hypervisor and NSX vSphere switches? So can we mix the two deployments? No. No, you're either going to deploy NSX for multi-hypervisor or you're going to deploy NSX for vSphere. Those would be different controller deployments. Are you saying all hypervisors must be in one common IP subnet? Absolutely not. The discussion we had before had to do only with vMotion. So from the NSX perspective, the hypervisors can be anywhere. They only need IP connectivity between them. There is a requirement for vMotion hosts to be in the same subnet. And if you want to adhere to that requirement, then at least, let's say, hosts in the same cluster should be in the same IP subnet but this is not an NSX requirement. What's the benefit of NSX on top of Fabric Path? Uh, I don't see any. You can do it if you wish. Personally, I would prefer to have traditional routed network, unless, of course, we get back to the previous discussion about vMotion. Licensing question. Is NSX bundled in vSphere 5.5 or is it an extra license? So NSX will be a separate license, but uh, we don't have any pricing details that we've announced on that yet. Do we support jumbo frames on top of overlay networks? So can VMs use jumbo frames? I haven't seen anything that says you can't. So unless, Scott, I don't know if you know that one or Nikhil. Uh, I'm I with you, Brad. I'm not aware of any restrictions that would prevent you from doing so other than just considerations about what the underlay will support. To find other virtual networking, data center, and cloud networking webinars, visit ipspace.net.